Hi, this is Suzanne Ogaitis Jones, and I coordinate the CPS and Occupant Protection Project for MIMS, which is funded by the Maryland Highway Safety Office. So, along with Cindy, um, we run the healthcare project for MIMS, and we're bringing you this webinar from the with funding from the Maryland Highway Safety Office. For those of you listeners who are child passenger safety technicians, we can provide one hour of continuing education credit towards your recertification. EMS clinicians can also obtain continuing ed credit. After the end of the webinar, you will receive a brief survey and an email with a verification um, for your CEUs. Be sure to fill out the survey and EMS folks, um, send us your provider number and name and we'll uh, log your credit. Okay, as you can see, we have a pretty full agenda, lots to learn and um, great information to share. And just by way of introduction, many of you know that last year there was about a 15% drop in the number of miles driven in the U.S. due to the pandemic and stay-at-home orders. But the fatality rate per miles driven rose 24% last year. Experts attribute this increase primarily to speeding and aggressive driving, as some drivers took the emptier roads as an invitation to do reckless things, which of course leads to motor vehicle crashes. Today's webinar will explain the kinematics of a motor vehicle crash and how restraints work. Then we'll, we will have some case studies, and then we will wrap up talking about documenting with the eMed system and how data collection at motor vehicle crashes integrates with other databases for analysis and interventions. So here are our speakers today, and I'm not going to go into their backgrounds. They'll each say a little bit about themselves. So my name is Tracy Eckstein Jones. Some people may know me as Tracy Eckstein because that was I was Officer Eckstein for many years, but now I'm Tracy Jones. I'm a mechanical engineer with Rimkus Consulting Group. Uh, I have a very unique history. I began as a Baltimore County police officer in 1995, and I was a police officer for 20 years. In 2001, Baltimore County Police started the crash team, and the crash team, I was one of the founding members on this team, and our job scope was primarily to handle serious and fatal crashes. And so I started seriously investigating crashes that actually started in 1999 in the traffic unit, but in 2001, it, we had a, a lot more. And then in 2007, eight, I started teaching uh, crash reconstructionists across the state of Maryland in the crash reconstruction classes and the advanced classes. In 2007, I got my, what you call an ACTAR accreditation. And that's the only accreditation for crash reconstructionists in, in the United States or in the, in the world. And I, I obtained that through testing and, and training in 07. Then in 2012, I became an adjunct instructor for University of North Florida. And there I teach across the country. I primarily teach how to analyze EDR data, which is the event data stored in airbag control modules and passenger vehicles. Uh, but I also teach motorcycle crash reconstruction and I have taught pedestrian crash reconstruction for them. In 2015, I retired and I joined Rimkus and I then started, my first degree was in psychology. So once I joined Rimkus, I went back to UMBC and obtained my mechanical engineering degree. Um, so now at Rimkus, my primary job is to investigate collisions, but I also do other mechanical engineering things. And I'm proud to say I'm a toilet expert and a bidet expert too. So anyway, that's my history. So now today we're gonna talk about occupant kinematics. We're gonna talk about the forces on a vehicle, the physics behind a vehicle collision, and then the occupant safety systems. And we're, this is gonna be a very brief description. This class could go for a full week. So Newton's laws are what we use in crash reconstruction. We use all three laws, but we're only gonna discuss two today. The first law is, a, is an object in motion will remain in motion until a force acts upon it. So if you have a vehicle traveling down the road, it will continue to travel down the road till a force acts upon it. The force could be the brake pedal and the braking system, or the force could be say a tree because they ran into the tree. Obviously that will stop a vehicle. And the other part of that law is an object at rest will remain at rest until a force acts upon it. So if you have a vehicle stopped at a red light, it will stay stopped at a red light till a force acts upon it, whether it be the acceleration in the engine or a vehicle rear-ending it and accelerating it forward. 
So to display this in this video, this video shows this vehicle is going to be moving forward. And when the vehicle has a force acting upon the front, the occupants are unrestrained, so they continue to move. So that's Newton's laws of dynamics. The force acts on the car, but not on the people because they're not restrained, so they continue to move forward. And the force that's acting upon them is when they contact the dash. So obviously that's very bad, especially if you're holding a baby. So Newton's second law is force equals mass times acceleration. So if you have a vehicle moving forward and it strikes this wall here in this video, the force equals the mass of the car times the acceleration. And mind you, when you calculate the acceleration, the time of a crash is only a tenth of a second to 0.15 seconds. And in fact, barrier crashes are 0.1 second. We've done tons of testing to prove that. Vehicle to vehicle, because there's a thing called restitution, they're, they last a little longer to 0.15 seconds. So you can see in that crash test, that force is acting on that car in a tenth of a second. So that's a lot of mass and a lot of force. And the object of restraints is to prevent that force from going to the occupants. So let's look at the second law and calculate it out in, from that last crash. You have a vehicle that weighs 4,000 pounds. You have, it goes into the wall at 30 miles per hour. You saw it rebounded, so it comes back out at three miles per hour. And that's a negative because it's going backwards now. So its total change of speed is 33 miles per hour. This is a very important number. This is what researchers use, biomechanical engineers use, and a lot of the world to determine injuries. The higher this change in speed, or what we call a delta V, the higher that change, the more likely there is injury. So if you think about a car, bumper systems are designed to take a delta V of five miles per hour and have no deformation. So if a car has a delta V of five, there's no deformation in the bumper, and there's really likely gonna be no injury. As you get up to 10 miles per hour, there may be some neck strain, some muscle soreness. As you get up to 15 and on, there's chance of injury. And the higher you go, the worse it gets. At 30 miles per hour, that's pretty darn bad. But I just had one where a dump truck hit a Ford, I think it was a Ford Expedition, head on. The Delta V was 70 miles per hour. That's one of the highest I've ever seen. And ironically, all four occupants, three children and one adult, did survive the crash. Now, I'm not saying they survived very well, but they did survive. So now going back to our scenario, we have a delta V of 33 miles per hour. The time for the crash is 0.1 seconds. So the acceleration, acceleration is miles per hour per second, per second, actually, I forgot the second there, or feet per second squared. So if it, the acceleration is 33 miles per hour, or if the speed, change of speed is 33 miles per hour, you divide it by the 0.1, you get 30, 330 miles per hour per second squared. Okay, so that is a lot of acceleration. If you think about an airplane, an airplane has that acceleration, but it's not over a second, it's over many seconds. So this is in this car at that time. And then you can calculate the force because force is the mass of the vehicle, which we have to go to slugs because we're working in American units, times the acceleration, we have to go to feet per second squared. And so it's 60,000 pound forces of force, that vehicle hits that wall. So we don't want that force going into the body and that's why there are safety systems. So in a collision, there's actually three collisions in a vehicle collision. The first collision is the vehicle versus the object. It could be vehicle versus vehicle, or it could be vehicle versus fixed object or tree. That's our first collision. Our second collision is the occupant versus the vehicle. Because while the vehicle gets stopped, the occupant will continue to move and either it will collide with the safety systems or if they're unrestrained, it'll collide with the steering wheel, the dash and so forth. And this is in a frontal collision. And then we have a third collision. Our organs are primary, are pretty much just suspended in our bodies. There's nothing really holding them 
securely in place. So as we go forward into the steering wheel, our organs are gonna go forward into the chest wall and so forth, and our brains are gonna move into our skulls. And it, this can cause serious injuries. They're called inertial injuries. These can result in fatalities and worse. So we wanna reduce the change of velocity on the body so we can reduce the movement of the organs. So in a frontal collision, we have this Mazda going into a wall. The force coming into the vehicle is coming in from the front of the vehicle going front to rear. So an occupant, as you saw before, is gonna to continue to move forward to it. The occupant encounters either a safety system or the steering wheel if they're unrestrained. So if you look at the occupant movement, the force comes in the front towards the rear. Occupant can, continues to move till they strike the steering wheel here. So that's what we want to prevent because now that force is going through the steering wheel right into that occupant's chest. In a rear collision, we have the force coming in through the rear of the vehicle going from rear to front. So this is a little different dynamic. So if you look at the occupant, the force is coming in through the rear. The occupant is seated. The seat back's holding that occupant together. The seat is actually a part of the vehicle, so it's being accelerated forward, but the occupant's not. So the occupant actually goes rearward into the seat back, and their head, you can see here in number two, strikes the headrest. That's why we have headrests, to prevent that excursion on the head and not allow it to go back too far. So then as the body goes backwards, eventually the body rebounds. Now the rebound distance scientifically has been determined. It's typically one third of the travel distance in the opposite, in the first direction. So if it's a rear impact, how, how, many, how much distance they travel rearward, say it's a foot, then they would travel a third of a foot forward. That's the typical rebound. So we don't want, the rebound's not nearly as dangerous as the first initial motion. So in a side impact, we have the forces coming in through one side and going out through the other as shown in this, this crash test. So with the occupant, the force comes into the side door and you can see there's nothing protecting the occupant from contact to that door. The space is very limited. So the force is going right into the occupant's body. That's why we want to put an airbag there to cushion that so all that force doesn't go into the body and cause damage. Side impacts are very dangerous because we don't have the engine between us or even a trunk, even though the trunk's mostly air, between us and the actual contact point. So side collisions are typically much worse than frontal or rear collisions. So the goal of restraint systems is to prevent contact to the vehicle, especially in side collisions. We want to, and the goal is to make a safe positioning of the occupant. So the seat belt, we want to keep them in position in that seat. And then we also want to increase the time of the collision. So remember, we talked about that delta V. We want to increase the time so that delta V is over a longer time, which makes it less dangerous and less likely to have injuries. So that is the ultimate goal of restraint systems. Restraint systems cannot work properly if they're not used properly. So here we have a chart that shows on the bottom, it, the delta V is in meters per second, or change of velocity is in meters per second. The blue numbers are actually miles per hour for you. So, and then on the left side, the vertical axis is the probability of a serious injury. So if you see the dashed, short dashed line is belted and airbagged occupants. So with a delta V of 33 miles per hour, there's a 30% chance of serious injury. So that's not wonderful, but not too bad. But let's look at the airbag only, which is the longer dashed line. At 33 miles per hour, there's a 90% chance of a serious injury. So then the red line is seatbelt only. Seatbelt only does better than airbag only, but there's still about a 60, just under a 60% chance of a serious injury. So obviously using airbags and seatbelts is much better than using one or the other. 
So how does how do seat belts work and how do restraint systems work? So there's an airbag control module in every vehicle these days. And this air bag control module has an accelerometer in it. If you think about your iPhone and when you turn it around, that's an accelerometer detecting acceleration and the rotation of the phone. Well, the accelerometer in the airbag control module does the same thing. It, it detects acceleration and it, or you could say deceleration too, but acceleration is just positive or negative. So basically the airbag control module wakes up at first contact to a crash, starts detecting and analyzing the acceleration or the G forces. And then it starts a prediction algorithm and it tries to predict how bad this crash is gonna be. And so then it determines what safety systems it needs to deploy. And mind you, these deployments occur in about 10, 15, 20 milliseconds most of the time. And the algorithm runs anywhere from 50 to 80 milliseconds typically. Some will run longer depending on the manufacturer. This is all top secret stuff. We don't know their algorithms. But anyway, as it analyzes the G-forces, it determines what it needs to do. So you have a frontal impact in this scenario one. It determines it needs to fire the pretensioner in the seatbelt. So it fires that pretensioner that stitches up the seatbelt. And then it fires the air plug bag. So as the seat belt is tightening up, the occupant's still moving forward. It's stretching the webbing of the seat belt and the occupant impacts the airbag, which further slows down their change of speed and slows them down gently as opposed to a huge force from the crash. So seat belts, here's the components of a seat belt. Seat belt has webbing, which is made of Kevlar. We have the retractor and we have the D-ring or B-pillar and the buckle with the tongue that goes inside. These are the important things to inspect after a collision to determine what type of usage was there. All right, so the pretensioners, there's two types of pretensioners. There's the retractor pretensioner that fires, fires the igniter and it actually reels the seatbelt back in. You know the vehicle has one of these pretensioners if when you go into the vehicle afterwards and the seatbelt is locked in a position and you can't retract it or pull it out anymore. Okay, so that's a good sign that the pretensioner was fired and potentially the seatbelt was used. The buckle pretensioner is on at the buckle side and you see this, the stretchy part under the buckle. It will compress when the igniter fires it will compress the buckle pulling the seat belt down so you have to actually inspect the buckle assembly to see if this is scrunched down this is less used over the retractor one these days so anyway seat belts seat belts need to be worn properly to be effective and all you car seat technicians know the proper fit you want it low around the hips, you want it across the chest, centered on the shoulder. So with a seat belt, you're gonna look for marks in these areas to determine it was used properly. However, you can look from, if you see marks in other areas, you can determine it was possibly not used properly. If you see chafing under the armpit, then obviously they put the seat belt under the arm. And obviously it did not work properly and most likely you're gonna have a lot of bruising and redness on the chest. If the lap belt is too high, you're gonna see bruising and redness around the abdomen and abdomen injuries. So the seat belt is made of Kevlar. The Kevlar allows the seat belt to actually stretch. So you will see this post collision if the occupant loaded the seat belt. So the Kevlar, allow, the stretching allows more ride down of the collision on top of the added protection with the pretensioner and the airbag. It's extending our time again, which is our goal to increase that time for that change of velocity. And it's also allowing stretching, but preventing the occupant from contacting the steering wheel or other parts of the vehicle. The seatbelt is designed to spread the forces across proper parts of the body so there is no serious injury. Now, that is very dependent on the occupant's health too. If you have a frail elderly person in the driver's seat, most likely there's a good chance the seat belt, even if it's worn properly, could fracture a hip 
or crack a, a rib or chest bone. So here you have, what do you want to look for after the collision? So you, to look, see if a seatbelt's worn, you want to look for stretching on the webbing as seen in this top picture and the picture to the left, you can see my hand holding, there's a lot of stretching on the seatbelt. You also want to look for abrasions on the D-link, which is on the bottom right. You can see the abrasions on the D-link where the seatbelt braided the, the plastic and actually melted it a little. You also want to look for what we call witness marks on the buckle. If you look at the buckle I'm holding on the left, you can see these, these marks on the buckle where when it was latched, it actually pulled tight and made these little marks. Another thing you want to look for is now that the seatbelt's locked by the pretensioner, can it be rebuckled? This one that I'm showing you here now, I could not rebuckle back into that seat. It actually would not go. That tells me that that seatbelt was buckled against the seat back at the time of the impact, and the occupant was sitting on the seatbelt. They were not using it. This is very common, especially in Baltimore City, I hate to say it. People sit on their seatbelts to get rid of that ding, but they don't actually wear them. So on the occupants, you want to look for marks. Redness, if you're an EMS or cop and you just see them immediately, you want to look for redness in the areas of contact, whether it be on the shoulder, low around the waist. If they had it under their arm, there most likely will be some severe abrasions under the arm, especially if the crash is a larger one. And you want to look for marks on the abdomen and whatnot to determine how the seatbelt was worn and if it was worn. So the airbag, these are the components of your airbag. Your airbag stuffed in the steering wheel. Many people say after an airbag deploys, my car's on fire or there's smoke. Well, actually the airbag has powder in it to keep it from sticking. So when it deploys, it deploys properly and it's not stuck in a funky manner. So you have the igniter on the back of the airbag inside the steering wheel. You do not want to apply voltage to this if it has not been deployed to test it to see if it needs to be deployed. Trust me. So anyway, these are the, your systems. So airbags, we have frontal airbags, which protect you in a frontal collision. We have the ones on the side here, or the side of the seats are called side torso airbags. These protect the occupants thorax and torso from side impact collisions. It allows a little ride down of the crash and protection from contact to the doors and B pillar. Then on the right here, we have side curtain airbags. Side curtain airbags protect the occupant, occupant primarily their head from contacting parts of the vehicle, from going outside of the vehicle. And in rollover events, they keep the vehicle, in, the occupant inside and prevent the occupant from contacting the side of the vehicle. So then we have here, we have knee bolster airbags. There's a lot of discussion about these, about how well they work, how effective they are. Some people say they actually cause more injuries. But needless to say, their goal is to prevent contact to the dash, to prevent knee and femur injuries and possibly hip injuries as the knee is pushed back into the hip, causing you know, damage to the hip, hip bones and the, the femur. There's also a knee bolster bracket Instead of an airbag, this bracket's in the knee bolster and it will crush as it's contacted to allow the occupant to ride down the crash. Another safety feature in vehicles these days is the occupant weight sensor. So some of you, probably not all of you, remember back in the 90s when children were being killed by airbags. It is now required to have a weight sensor in the right front seat. This weight sensor detects the weight in that seat and determines whether it should activate the uh, passenger front airbag. So if it detects a weight under anywhere from 50 to 80 pounds, depending on the manufacturer, it will deactivate the right front seat and the airbag will not deploy. This prevents injuries to children. While we tell everyone not to put children in this seat, not everyone listens. So that's the safety mechanism that manufacturers have put in the vehicle. This is also a good way to tell if that, that seat was occupied. If that airbag did not deploy and someone says, oh, I was in it, you might want to question that. There still could be a problem with the system, but you still might want to question whether they're really there if they definitely weigh over 80 pounds. 
So airbag functioning, let's look at their risk. So airbags are a secondary restraint. They are not meant to prevent injury if you're not using your seat belt properly. So a study was done here and the red numbers is the delta V in miles per hour. The rest is in kilometers per hour. So this is a frontal collision and the airbags are allow you to ride down that collision more along with the seat belt. And you can see as the delta V increases and with the no airbag, the it, with no airbag from the uh, serious injuries and the fatalities increase more than with airbag, um, the, the injuries will be less and the fatalities will be less as the speed goes up in comparison to each other. So the, the idea of this study or the thought in this study is to show that airbags definitely do help, but you need to be using your seatbelt also because without the seatbelt, it's a game changer. So now we're gonna talk about just forward, forward facing versus rear facing car seats. So in forward facing car seats in a frontal collision, you have the same movement as a, a normal seat belted occupant. As the vehicle is slowed forward, the child in the car seat continue to move forward. The child loads the harness straps and then eventually they rebound back into the seat. So you get the normal head excursion on the child just like you would on a adult. That's a problem for children. Children can't handle the excursion on the head that us adults can. So you really wanna prevent that. Also, the reason we have the harnesses is because they're loading all two harnesses as opposed to one seatbelt, which helps the child a little. But when you look in the rear facing, the rear facing in a frontal collision, the child loads the entire seat back. There's even force and even pressure on the child. And the rebound, there is some rebound, but it's minimal because remember that's about a third of the rearward movement. So th this is why we want children rear facing as long as possible to prevent injuries. So what do you wanna look for on car seats? You wanna look for the routing of the belts on the car seat, of course. You wanna look for the stretching of the three-part harness because that harness is Kevlar also and it should stretch as the child loads it. Now, if the harnesses are pulled through the shell, that tells you that that car seat was tightened too tight. And there's a good chance that they were using both the latch system and the seat belt system. There was too much force holding everything back and it did not allow the seat and the child to ride down the crash. You also wanna look for evidence of contact points. So what I mean by that is the child's in the rear seat. So look at the seat back of the front seats and see if you see any scuffs on the plastic or indentations of contact points where that child moved forward and contacted those seats. If it's a car seat's not secured properly, i.e. it's too loose or they used a wrong method, you can expect spinal injuries, extremity injuries, especially if, because if they move forward, they're gonna contact that seat belt. So broken legs are very common in children and head injuries because they get too much excursion on that head and their brains are allowed to move inside their skulls causing inertial injuries. And some, especially in rollovers, you will get ejection. If they're not secured properly, they will be able to come loose, come out of the seat and be ejected. So on your post-crash inspection, you wanna look for the routing of the belts. And this, you can see, this was, uh, I forget where this crash was, I think it was in Virginia, but this is how the seat was found post-crash. So clearly this, the seat belt was routed wrong and the child was actually sitting on top of the booster seat. So clearly that's a problem and that did not secure the child properly. So here's a video of what happens when it's too tight. Please ignore the music. I couldn't, I didn't have time to delete it. So as you can see in that crash, because the seat was too tight, the the child, the dummy, loaded the harnesses and they pulled straight through the seat because there was no give. And that's what we don't want. So too tight is actually a bad thing. So if you have harnesses that are 
strapped in wrong, too loose, uh, the chest clip is wrong, you're also going to see injuries. You're going to see severe bruising along where the harness was actually resting. You'll see spinal injuries because the children were allowed to move too much and did not pr properly ride down the crash. If the chest clip is too low, you're going to see abdominal injuries and bruising and potential internal injuries in that area. If the lap belt is too low, you'll see the child submarining under the seat belt. You also can see neck injuries from the excursion, uh, pelvic injuries, chest injuries, and of course, head injuries due to the movement of the brain inside the skull. So if you look at this figure, the top is a lap belt only, and you can see the lap belt is too hot, is, is not positioned properly, it's a little too high. And in the impact, the child actually jackknifes over the lap belt because there is no shoulder belt. In B, you can see the lap belt is too high and the seat belt's not necessarily positioned perfectly. The child actually submarines under. And then in this case, they're gonna submarine under and go into the seat back and likely damage leg bones, feet bones, and femur bones. And C is another version of the jackknife uh, due to the improperly positioned seat belt. So this video shows when it's too loose, what happens? And it's comparing a loose safety belt and in, incorrectly routed harness strap and a loose harness clip. And in the foreground is the improper install and the background is the proper installation. And you can see the difference. As you can see in the foreground, the child, the dummy moved much farther forward, had much, much more head excursion, and you see how much more the seat moved. So this is going to lead to much uh, more significant injuries on that child. The ne next part of the video is going to show you an overhead so you can see the excursion even more. So this and this one is an improperly attached booster seat. The first video shows that the shoulder belt's not routed properly through the beast booster seat. The second part of the video shows the shoulder belt under the child's arm. So you can see in the first part, there's a lot of excursion on the head and, sh and shoulders because it's not properly valid. And then the second one with it under the arm, the child actually jackknifes all the way through causing severe, severe, this would cause severe abdominal injuries and most likely some extremity injuries. So I'm about to wrap up. This was quick and brief, but this was a crash I handled before I retired. I think it was back in 2013 or 14. Anyway, this, the black car, the Honda C, is a Honda CRV. It crossed, it was traveling way too fast for the speed and it crossed the center line and hit our Jeep here head on. It's an offset head on, but it was a catastrophic result. So you see, this is the driver's seat here. You see the airbag deployed. You see the passenger airbag did not deploy. That's because there was no one in that seat. So the weight sensor detect, did not detect enough weight, so it did not deploy. And you can see in the bottom picture, the seat belt is actually not that you can tell, but it's locked against the B pillar. That tells me the pretensioner fired and it locked it in that position. So you cannot move it at all. Therefore, the driver was not wearing the seat belt. So this driver actually, she broke her leg and she had some other external injuries. So you can see for her contact points, the windshield, her hand got up into the windshield and punched the windshield out. And that's in the upper left. Then in the bottom right, you can see the dash, her knees contacted the dash and destroyed the dash here. So there's her contact point. She moved forward and she made it into the airbag, but her knees still contacted the dash and her hand contacted the windshield and she sustained a broken leg. She was lucky compared to her daughter. Her daughter was in the back seat behind her. And this is how I found the seat. The seatbelt's routed correctly. The problem is the child was not using the seatbelt at all. 
the child was actually just in the car seat, just the way it is. So the child went forward, because it's a frontal impact, you go forward into the seat back. And it's hard to see in this picture, but she actually there's actually contact points into the seat back. This child sustains multiple broken bones, but also a traumatic head injury. And last I knew, she was brain dead. I have not heard, I never heard what the end result was. So then she had a two-year-old brother next to her in a forward-facing car seat. Now this car seat was not installed properly and he was not harnessed properly, but he only sustained a broken leg from contacting the seat back here because he moved forward, he still contacted the seat back, but his, only, his injury was just a broken leg, which is much better than the results of his sister who wasn't restrained at all. And as you can see, here's his harness, his harness straps. There's a little bit stretching, but not enough for the force of this crash. You should see severe stretching, which means it was too loose and he was allowed to go too far forward. And really what stopped him was the seat back and not the harness. And then you can see the twisting of the latch belt here. It was twisted and it was extremely loose. Now, mind you, in a real crash with a proper installation, we always test when we do car seats, we have the one inch test. It can, the car seat cannot move more than one inch. After a crash, that Kevlar has stretched. So it may move more than that one inch, but it's not gonna move to the extent that this car seat has been moved and can be moved. So you just beware of that. So that is all I have. This is my contact information. If you have any questions or comments or you need help with anything, I'm more than willing to help anybody. And that is it. So I'm going over to Justin, Justin I believe. Yes, thank you, Tracy. That was wonderful. Um, really, I know I feel like I've, I've heard a lot of this before and yet I learned a lot from this. So this is really great. And uh, Justin, we're interested to hear what you have to say. Okay, um, I'll try to make it brief. So that way we can move on. Um, so I'm Sergeant Justin Zimmerman. Um, I'm currently on the Maryland State Police crash team. Uh, our protocol is uh, anything high profile, complex, uh, alcohol, narcotics involved, commercial vehicles, multiple fatalities, uh, criminal charges uh, that would result from it, you know, racing, et cetera, or um, any police pursuits we handle um, for the agency that may result in fatalities. Um, just a little background, I've been a reconstructionist since 2003. Uh, a car seat tech since 2003, and I've been assigned to the, uh, I started my career in 2001 at the uh, Leonardtown Barrack, transferred to the La Plata Barrack in Charles County, and now I'm currently uh, full-time uh, on the crash team as the Southern Region Supervisor, which oversees uh, Charles, Calvert, and St. Mary's counties. Um, we're going to cover two cases I handled. Uh, one uh, case we were able to show uh, misuse. The other um, was proper use. Uh, both of them resulted in fatalities, uh, but it's just to show that even with proper use, you know, the crash dynamics uh, like Tracy covered can still, you know, exceed the limitations of the car seats. Um, case uh, one that we're going to cover happened back in March uh, 2013, Charles County on Maryland Route 257 north of uh, Route 254. Uh, vehicle one was a 2000 Mercury Sable operated by a 24-year-old female. She was impaired by prescription drugs. Uh, the right rear passenger was her two-year-old daughter who uh, passed away in the crash and left rear passenger was her one-year-old uh, that had minor injuries. Uh, the other vehicle was a 2010 Toyota Camry operated by a 73-year-old female. She had minor injuries as well. All right, um, this is the car seat that had the injury in it. And just to go sh to show you the misuse, you can see the clip and how uh, it bent uh, as it was not properly put on. And then also how um, creative parents get when uh, trying to come up with uh, things to put these car seats in when they don't get good 
uh, education. And you can see in the bottom photos, uh, she tried to use uh, the tether with a dog leash and attach it to the bar on the bottom of the seat. Um, again, you have misuse, but, uh, and you'll kind of see from the pictures I show you the, what Tracy covered, the crash dynamics in this is, this uh, female was on the opposite side of the impact, so she didn't take a lot of the uh, brunt of the crash. Um, the fatal misuse on this, um, again, improper placement and bent. Uh, in this case, I had uh, kids in safety seats come out and they helped me inspect the car seats for this one. Um, here is the at fault vehicle. She lost control, went into a, a what we call a yaw and crossed center line sideways and got T-boned. Um, the fatality, of course, was uh, where the impact is, so she took the brunt of the injuries. Um, so for this one, uh, she entered a guilty plea to vehicular manslaughter. Um, per the plea agreement, there was no active jail time. The state's attorney felt that nobody, even the judge, would not put a mother in jail for killing her own kid. Um, so that's what they agreed to. And the female driver has attended every child safety seat checkpoint held in Charles County since that time um, and actually has turned her life around and, and recovered from substance abuse, uh, which, you know, I unfortunately took the crash to get her to wake up. Um, Um, positive and negatives to the investigation. Car seats were left in place so we could do a proper inspection. Um, EMS fire actually took notes and photos of children in the seating position. This happens far and few between. Uh, Tracy can probably back that up with her time on job. By the time we get there as reconstructionists, everybody's gone. Um, but luckily the, the fire and EMS uh, guys and gals took took notes and actually took photos for me showing where everyone was as they were doing an extrication. So that helped out. Um, exact tightness of shoulder straps could not be determined. Of course, they took the, uh, they made them loose to get the children out. Um, but from talking to EMS and everyone that got them out, it appeared they were at least in there correctly. Um, case review two uh, occurred um, May of 20, uh, 2006 in Charles County. It was at 301 and St. Patrick's Drive. Uh, vehicle one was a 98 Nissan Sentra operated by a 20 year old male. Uh, he was drag racing his friend who was in unit two and speeds were uh, 75 between 75 and 82 miles an hour at impact in a 45 zone. Um, Unit two uh, was a 2003 Chevy Malibu operated by a 17 year old male. Uh, again, they were drag racing unit one. His speed was 71 to 80 miles an hour in the posted 45 mile an hour zone. And then there actually was a, a third vehicle that was um, part of it. And uh, this is the vehicle that was struck with the uh, fatality. So it was a 99 Oldsmobile operated by a 29-year-old male. Front passenger was the wife, 29-year-old female. Left rear passenger was a five-year-old male with serious injuries. Uh, the center pa rear passenger, 30-year-old female with serious injuries. And the right rear passenger was a seven-year-old um, who was deceased. Um, they were stopped on southbound 301 at St. Patrick's for a left red turn signal to make a U-turn to go back north after having dinner. Uh, car seats um, that were in the car, uh, based on the crash dynamics, the car seats were left in the car, so that kind of helped us out. Um, they just pretty much pulled the kids out of the car to get them uh, the help they needed. Um, as you can see, where the car seats ended up, um, there's a lineup of the impact from vehicle one and, and the third vehicle and how we found the booster seats uh, crushed in the car. 
Um, the Nissan Sentra just showing you the crash damage. Um, that the Nissan did roll over after impact along with the uh, Alera. Um, unit two, the Malibu, they had a side swipe um, prior to sending the Nissan into the turn lane, so it was minimal damage, um, but it was able to be imaged for the airbag control module that um, Tracy touched on, so we were able to get data from uh, all the vehicles. Um, here's scene photos showing the final rest of all the vehicles. That's the intersection. If you see where my cursor is, they were sitting in that uh, turn, left turn lane and all the vehicles were traveling south, rear end them and sent them into uh, the northbound lanes. Um, this is a 3D animation we did for court um, as we were preparing for it to go to trial. Uh, the uh, One of the members of the team, Dave Reinholt was uh, able to do the animation and, and we provide it to a state's attorney. So it just kind of gives you an idea of the impact. So just, you know, those kind of help people out in court um, when uh, you're trying to, you know, get a, a conviction. Um, Conclusion, uh, NHTSA responded. They're a good resource and did all my inspections for me um, and actually used it as a case study. Uh, they found no misuse during the inspections. The gentleman in the Nissan pled guilty to vehicular manslaughter and received an 18-month active sentence, um, which in the realm of things isn't really much, but Maryland does not see uh, fatal car crashes as a crime of violence, so it really doesn't get the sentencing that it should. Um, positive and negatives, again, car seats were left in place. Um, and again, I had some great firefighters in EMS in Waldorf that took notes and, and photos of the children as they were um, in their seating positions during extrication. So that really helped out. Um, you know, some people get mad if fire takes pictures on scenes. I, you know, if I can get them and they help me, whatever it, as long as it you know helps my case i don't really care um common challenges in these cases that we deal with um is the lack of notes honestly from ems and fire uh when we get called as reconstructionists we may get there hours later and you know there's no notes there's no nothing nobody can tell us how we're you know we're lucky if we get where people were sick so um you know First and foremost, safety and care for injured comes first, but you know, in the back of everyone's mind should be taking uh, notes. And then also if you have a case where you need some assistance, like I said, NHTSA uh, is a great resource along with Maryland's uh, kids and safety seats. Um, this is my information. So if you need any question, you know, need anything, just, um, Feel free to contact me. Like Tracy said, I'm, I'm willing to help anybody. So uh, whatever I can do, just let me know. And I think we have a few minutes. We can um, take a couple questions on uh, either Tracy or Justin's presentation right now, if there are some questions. We do have one question that has been put into the chat um, stating that they understand that the seatbelt cannot be rebuckled if the belt was buckled under or behind the occupant. The question is, is it possible to rebelt a seat belt after a severe crash if the occupant was wearing the seat belt correctly? Uh, typically, yes, unless they're extremely, extremely skinny. Um, you can, oh, I have never found it where I couldn't rebuckle it if they were wearing it properly. Um, only when it's against the seat belt, seat back and they're sitting on it, because that igniter and retractor yanks it back in, it's really stretched against that seat back and then you unbuckle it, it, it pops off literally, and then you can't get it back in. I mean, I guess if I had a lot of strength, I could get it back in, but I'm old now, so I can't. Okay, thank you, Tracy. Um, thank you both Justin and Tracy for your talks, very interesting and um, great examples of 
with the real crashes and some of the challenges with um, what you face is trying to figure out what really happened and, and some of the, the things that make your job a little bit easier. We are going to change the focus for this last part of the webinar and talk about data collection from a systems level and then how that data is used. But I want to go just briefly a little bit into some guidelines for handling car seats in a crash. And Cindy's going to do this with me. So crashed car seats, um, the information for caregivers is that NHTSA recommends that car seats be replaced following a moderate or severe crash. Um, and this is something that you as either law enforcement or EMS or just car seat technicians, if you're talking to parents, you you know want to stress that they need to replace these seats. But then NHTSA does define minor crash, and I'm not going to read th this through, but it's also in the handouts and on their website. Um, this is something that you should not be defining. This is something that the parent, the caregiver can call the manufacturer and see if the manufacturer agrees it's a minor crash. Um, the role that you would have here would just be telling parents they really do have to replace that seat as soon as possible. Now, when we look at it for EMS, it's a little different, and Cindy's going to explain this. The when handling it, yeah, there it is. Okay, um, when handling a car seat that has been involved in a crash that EMS is responding to, realizing that NHTSA has set standards for crashes that 911 is typically, although sometimes people do, is typically not called for. So neither law enforcement, EMS, fire, or rescue arrive. When we have a child that is in a child safety seat and that vehicle has been in a crash, if the child's care is a priority one, for those who are in EMS, you know exactly what I mean, but for those who are child passenger safety technicians, that means we have a physiologic concern that the child's airway, breathing, circulation, chest and abdomen may have a, a major injury. We need to get the child out. We need to get the child out quickly. And we want to go ahead and cut both the way that uh, the, the child out of the car seat and if necessary, how the car seat is installed in the seat to turn the child to bring them out and provide spinal protection. If the child, if the car seat's been installed correctly and the child's correctly installed in the car seat, and the child needs to be transported, which is often the case, but doesn't appear to have life-threatening physiologic injuries or any major anatomic injuries, it's preferable both for the reconstructionists who you've just heard and for the family for the next 24 hours to unbuckle the harnesses, loosen them and take the child out, still providing spinal protection. We don't immobilize everyone anymore, but spinal protection that leaves the car seat intact. We are working very hard with this grant to make sure that emergency departments have a car seat and ha everyone has had some degree of awareness level training so the child can go home in a new seat. But there are times when that's not possible. It's also times when the family does not live here. So if the car seat uh, upon inspection looks okay and it hasn't met there hasn't been intrusion into that seat it's possible the family might need to use that seat for the next 24 hours most of the manufacturers will tell you if the child is transported if anyone in the ambulance is transported they want that car seat replaced some health insurance policies will do that some automobile insurance policies will do that and again we are trying to work with the emergency departments so that a new seat that has never been involved in a crash can be used Thank you, Cindy. And just there's a little reminder for the EMS folks online that there's some resources from our office about transporting children properly in ambulances. So that's right there. That's a, that's a whole other 30 minute lecture. We're not going to do it. And I don't want to go into it, but certainly want you to learn about that. So as I said, we're changing gears a little bit. We're going to talk about some of the collection of the data and what happens with it. Um, NHTSA states that safety starts with crash data, and this diagram illustrates the overall process from crash to analysis. All crashes resulting in a vehicle being towed away, personal injury, or fatality are reported. The state, county, or local law enforcement officer who first arrives at the scene of a reportable crash records the crash data, and the EMS clinician on the scene will use eMeds to document pre-hospital patient information. 
Okay, Cindy's now going to go and explain how EMS clinicians would document a motor vehicle crash in eMeds. And Jason Cantera from MIMS is in attendance if there are any questions about the system. And then after that, we will have Mark Scarborough from the National Study Center give an overview on how eMeds and other databases are used for analysis. Thank you, Suzanne. And I um, first want to recognize um, the tutoring that I have received from Jason Cantera. I am a clinical nurse specialist and I do not fill out eMeds reports, but I have learned um, how to do that and we are creating a series. What I'm going to share with you today is just related to the car crashes. We did actually complete this entire patient care record and got to a 96% validation down at the bottom. Um, but for the purposes of this, we want to highlight how important certain screens are. The first screen that may or may not be filled out actually going to the scene um, is the dispatch, which from a long list of priorities, this is the street, highway, road, transportation location. It's also helpful, and with this demonstration, I wasn't able to fill in specifics on the location, but as much information as we can give about where that actually occurred. All of our demonstration EMEDS reports occur in Elkton, Maryland. Um, that's because these do not go into a national data set. If you go to the next slide. The next uh, set of decisions that are most important when we're responding to a crash is to make sure that it, either the patient is identified as trauma or as both trauma and medical. It is possible that someone who's been in a crash had a medical emergency that led to the crash. It's also often in the case of children if their child has been injured and they also have an underlying condition that that would also need to be documented. The rest of the alerts that are on this page are not a applicable to most of the time are not applicable to a motor vehicle crash. Again, if the patient has had a stroke or had a cardiac arrest, this would look very different. We are talking about a preschool panda bear is the uh, fictitious name that we came up for this patient. The next um, option is to choose whether it is one patient or two patients. And typically that is who I am treating. I can also indicate if we go on to the patient care reports, I can also indicate if I transported that patient or if I treated that patient, but it was transported by another unit. So Suzanne, if you can go to the next slide. Oh, did it go? Not changing slides easily. It's not advancing. So let me let just me try again. A there it goes. There while we go there. And the next slide is going to start the patient information. Um, we're putting the child's age in, in years, putting, um, we want to document everything in kilos, but it is possible that the family member will give us that weight in pounds. The system is now built to automatically convert, and that's done specifically for medication administration. All medications are calculated based on kilograms. Um, this, In this case, it was estimated, and then we put in some basic information about the patient's home. As we move on, we get to our chief complaint, and that's going to be a lot more specific on the patient's condition, how they present in what we call a primary survey, which goes over airway, breathing, circulation, disability. We did enter vital signs on this patient, and hopefully we'll be entering a series of vital signs. Um, the anatomic locations here will correlate often in a crash with where the uh, crash occurred and the part of the car this patient that we created was seated in a booster seat closest to the side of the impact. If you can go to the next slide. When we go to document our assessment, there, there, it's important to use these power tools and to actually document what we found on the various parts of the body. Um, the blue shows up as normal, so I went through a series of the body systems, 
and those were normal for this patient. When we document one extremity, it's helpful to document the other one, especially with a crash. Please realize not all of this documentation is done at the scene. Often this is documented on a short form or a, a waterproof pad, and then this is entered into eMeds after the patient has either in transport or after the patient at handoff has been done at the hospital. But we do want to go through and document was it was it normal or was there an abnormality. You can see here on this example, this is left elbow, that you can switch at the top and toggle to also document the right side of the body. We can go to the next slide. This is very important for our colleagues in law enforcement and our colleagues that are studying crash analysis. And that is where on the vehicle um, was a restraint used. And if this had been an adult, it would say seat belt and you can indicate lap or shoulder. There's also a way to indicate whether any airbags were deployed at the time. And to indicate over on the far left where that impact was and where the collision was. The other point that we wanted to make is that many patients will be both a have a, a positive finding for category A or B. A is that physiological finding I talked about when we were discussing getting children out of car seats. B is the anatomical. C is going to be mechanism of injury and D is going to be pre-morbid, coexisting, illnesses, but also the very young and the very old. It is possible for a patient to be a category A or B and also have a category C or D. And often we find that once A or B has been indicated, that next section is left blank. And we really would like to know whether it's not applicable or whether that patient does meet a criteria C or criteria D. Was the patient referred to a trauma center? And if so, which trauma center? Okay. And then um, we're going ahead and documenting procedures. For this patient, the procedure that was documented was the application of a soft collar. Um, and there was no need to document backboard, but this is also where we would document. And for those who are in EMS, they know this. This is where we document if airway procedures were done, if IV procedures were done, you can add additional procedures at that top area. If you wanna go to the next slide. Uh, I do believe on this patient, I also documented the use of Tylenol and a pain score, and then a pain score before and after the administration of that Tylenol. The destination, um, we want to know was the patient um, transported by this ambulance or another ambulance, specifically which hospital. And you can see there's a drop down menu and there are codes assigned to each hospital. It's important to have this documented so that law enforcement knows where to get additional information from the hospital. Very good. All right. So now we're going to have Mark Scarborough from the National Study Center um, talk a little bit about how this data is used. So go ahead and mark, Mark, and just tell me when to change the slides. So looking at motor vehicle crash data, um, uh, I put a couple slides together. Uh, the continuum of data, there really is, um, the actual crash is just one part of an extensive timeline that uh, is a continuum of motor vehicle crash data. And there is a real uh, need to capture the entire continuum. Often uh, we end up having to work with little bits and pieces of the timeline where we get a data, a little bit of data from here, a little bit of data from there, but it's an incomplete picture. And with good data capture and good access, uh, our state can benefit uh, uh, with multiple safety and healthcare areas and initiatives. Our ongoing challenge is to uh, ensure that we are accessing and utilizing appropriately uh, our, in complete data which can be very diverse and very complex to tie together. But once that is accomplished, a very complete timeline can be developed. Uh, next slide, please. So um, the data systems. So today you heard about uh, eMeds in, in great detail. Uh, it's one of the data systems that we certainly uh, use. It is a, it is a huge piece of, uh, piece of the puzzle that we use. 
Um, but if we look at the the start of the crash of the the crash timeline starts with a crash, and the Maryland State Police have ACRS, ACRS stands for Automated uh, Crash Reporting System, and it is a statewide universal reporting system for for crash accident reports, um, which is very useful because that means the entire state is using a uniform system. So wherever a crash happens in the state of Maryland, when a report is written, it is the same whether it be in county hands or state hands. Um, Next, looking at triage and transport, that's where EMED steps in, that is, that is housed at MIMS and managed by MIMS. Um, it is built on the backboard, uh, the backboard, <laughs> there's my clinical background, on the backbone of, of NIMSIS, which comes from NHTSA, which is a national um, data system for EMS capture. Um, healthcare, there's a ton of data sets within healthcare, as you probably all know. Uh, we work with the Health Services Cost Review Commission, better known as HSCRC. That is actually a complete picture of every inpatient and outpatient record uh, for every hospital in the state of Maryland. That is a ginormous uh, data set. Uh, there's the Maryland State Trauma Registry, which all of the trauma centers in the state of Maryland report to. That is a wealth of data. There is the Chesapeake Regional Information System for Patients, better known as CRISP, which basically houses um, the, the main job of it is to house what medications people are prescribed. So when a patient comes in to say shock trauma and is not able to verbally tell the doctors and nurses what meds they're on, they can look in CRISP, look the patient up and see what meds that they are on. Um, then there's a host of different hospitals that have their own electronic medical record systems. University of Maryland uses uh, one called EPIC and that houses a ton of patient-based information that can be used as well. And the next step in the timeline is of data systems is outcome. So, you know, we have crash, we transport a patient, we take care of a patient, well, we, we have a crash victim, we transport a patient, we take care of a patient, and then we get to outcome. So you start looking at rehab data, you, look, you can also look at citation data at, with, within the court system. Um, that is something that certainly helps us look at safety initiatives and safety campaigns to see if they're working or not. And of course, unfortunately, we can also use medical examiner reports for those patients and or occupants who are fatal from crashes. Um, the partnership and data access is, is critical to getting this continuum of data. If without partnerships and collaboration, um, this, this, you, you're back to what I said earlier, you're just in the bits and pieces of data and you can't get a complete picture. You can probably answer a narrowly focused question, but if you want to look at a wide array of issues and look at a broad spectrum, uh, it really becomes difficult without cooperation and collaboration from data partners. Go. Um, so uh, now what I wanted to say here was as we grow these partnerships, as these data systems come together and we tie them together, the participants and the, the utilization of, 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 the products, of the data just uh, exponentially explodes. So as this continuum of data uh, grows, you know, you can look at crash data alone and crash data will be very informative to that crash or crashes. So about drivers and passengers or, and or a pet or a bicyclist, it can tell you about crashes and types of cars and, and restraint status and things of that nature. But that, that's it, that's, that's all it's gonna do. But if you tie that to triage and transport data, if you try to tie crash data to the EMETS data, for example, your, your um, knowledge base has grown significantly at that point in time. You're now growing the power of the data but, but moreover, you're growing the people and the entities who can benefit from this data. And as you go through and you bring in health data, the, 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 the power of the data set grows even greater. You start to see a cause and effects become more clear. You can start to, you can start to actually see that a crash of a certain uh, type or severity, as, as was mentioned earlier, results in worse injuries, or age come, becomes an issue, or trial child restraints were not used properly and there were bad results. Um, so all of that becomes more clear as we tie these data systems together. The number of beneficiaries just continues to grow as we can grow our data systems and our collaborations. Um, so when you get this, this complete continuum, that is crash through final outcome, and final outcome is not just a list of vehicle data, not just a, a vehicle details, or injury details, but it's all the way through to things like adjudication and return to work or return to normal life. That is the continuum that, that we work strive to, to create because just again, looking at little bits of the timeline is informative, but it will not give you that entire outcome 
to let you see when somebody, yeah, they, they discharged from the hospital. That's good. They did not end up at the ME's office with a, as a fatality. But when did they get back to normal life? Did they suffer a brain injury? Did they have a spinal cord injury? Uh, we're learning more and more every day, and I'm sure you, you hear it in the press, how concussions, which is, you know, from a, from a, a threat to life standpoint, is not that big of a threat to life. But disability-wise, it, it can be significant. So things like that give us, uh, when we start looking at the entire picture, we become much more informed and we can actually strive to improve things out in, out in the environment uh, at a greater level. So uh, the National Study Center uh, has a great example of some of this cooperation. Um, they pull all the data together from around the state of Maryland into something that's called CODES, the uh, Crash Outcome Data Evaluation System. Um, this assembly is an attempt to put that entire continuum of data together and give us that very, very wide spectrum picture that I've been, that I've been describing. This CODES has been utilized for numerous research, safety, and legislative needs for the state. Seat, uh, it's just some examples, seatbelt utilization. Uh, impaired driving, impaired driving citations, and one that seems to come up every year, and it's it's, it's on the agenda currently, is defending the metal, uh, motorcycle helmet law. Now, all of us tend to think that, you know, it's, it's us in the safety world, in the medical world, put a helmet on, it makes sense. But every year, uh, the legislature needs to see the data and the, and the numbers and the outcomes of motorcycle uh, crashes, and so that they can continue to keep the, uh, motorcycle helmet law on the books. Uh, one of the unique things is as we build these data sets, uh, there's always concern about um, the data becoming too powerful. You know, you, you now have too much information. And it's true, it is a lot of information, it's a lot of responsibility, but codes, uh, for example, ha is governed by a board of directors. And the board of directors is represented, um, is built by the rep rep representation of all of the data providers. So the different groups who provide data to codes sit on the codes board of directors and that gives us transparency. They are informed how their data is being used and if they decide that it's not being used in a way that they're comfortable with, then we have to sit down and have a discussion before we can continue that type of research or that type of work. So that gives us good transparency and oversight with the codes um, system and that is the model that uh, we like to use. We are building other data systems similar to codes to expand the, the um, uh, uh, capabilities, but CODES has become the model standard by which uh, cooperation and collaboration with data systems uh, for the state of Maryland, for especially related to NBC. So just in, in summing up, um, when we get good interagency cooperation and collaboration, um, we can do an awful lot. Uh, it's a very powerful data set, but again, responsibility has to be in place. Without it, as I said earlier, we end up with just little pieces, we end up with an incomplete puzzle. We have good pieces here and there, but we cannot put the entire picture together. And without the, the entire picture, it is difficult sometimes to come up with the most um, capable responses and campaigns that we wanna put in place to solve the issues that we, uh, we see out on the streets. Um, thank you, that concludes it. Thank you, Mark. That's it was wonderful. It really, I know for me, it, it helps to really see the specifics all the way up to the big picture and really feel how I'm, you know, my little part of it and, and, and what we can do. Um, I hope you guys felt the same. We have time for a few questions, if there are any. And then just while I'm, we're collecting questions, um, these are the handouts that are available through GoToWebinar. Um, I can also share with you the contact information that was provided on some of the slides um, through the follow-up emails. Are there any questions, Cindy? Yes, there are. Um, and a number of the questions I, are exactly what you just said. Um, so if you would like contact information for any of the speakers, our email address is cps at mims.org and I think you'll see that on another slide um, and we can get that information to go back to all those slides is not a good use of our time right now and I think I've answered everyone one of the questions um, that has come up specific to crashes is after a collision do safety belts remain locked so so in reference to that if a 
seatbelt pretensioner was commanded to deploy and this pretensioner is in the retractor, yes, they remain locked. And pretensioners are primarily in the front seats these days. There are some more advanced and more expensive vehicles that have pretensioners in the rear seats. But you have to remember the command from the airbag module has to be sent to fire that pretensioner to lock that seat belt. Otherwise, it won't be locked. Also, if it has that buckle retractor, the, the firing mechanism is in the buckle, you'll see the buckle scrunched, but the seat belt will move back and forth freely. The quite next the reminder. Go ahead. Go ahead, Cindy. No, go ahead, please. Well, I was just going to say quite the reminder of how our cars are computers ever, ever more each day. Mm -hmm. The next question, um, we do not have a lawyer on the phone, but I think we could have a good discussion between the our presenters. Can there be a memorandum of understanding put in place between EMS and law enforcement so that EMS photographs the crash scene and shares that for reconstruction purposes. It seems like it would greatly improve the information exchange. And I will start with a comment and then turn to our two law enforcement um, experts on that. There can be um, those types of things set up at the county and level. Um, please remember that EMS is going to be focused on the patient doing a scene survey, making sure the scene is safe for them to approach, to get the patients out of an unsafe situation, but they are then going to assess, treat, and transport safely a patient in an ambulance. When we say EMS and we're looking for additional information or photos, we need to be sure we are keeping our fire professionals in that partnership because they are the ones who will be at the scene until the scene is cleared or it is turned over to law enforcement. So uh, we need to reach out to both, both of those communities in many of our counties. That's a joint, most of our urban counties, that's a joint service. EMS and fire work for the same employer. As we partner with our volunteers, there are stations that are fire only or EMS only. But the technical question of uh, handing off of those photographs, I will leave to our two law enforcement reconstruction specialists. Uh, I'll, I'll leave it really to Justin, honestly, because I've been out for five, six years. But, you know, EMS has their own priorities and their first is, is safety and, and injury. Um, maybe there should be something for the first responding officers, because I know Justin gets their much later than I ever did. I got there pretty quickly. Um, well, like I said, in my presentation, you know, safety and all that comes first and, and patient care. Um, there has only actually been, in my travels in the state, only one jurisdiction that I've ever had issues with. Um, and they, they, they yell HIPAA for everything. Um, all the others, um, if I go to them and say, hey, did y'all happen to take any notes or any photos? I've had no problems getting it, um, it except for one jurisdiction. Um, so, I mean, I think it would be a logistical nightmare to come up with an MOU for each county. Um, but you just have to, you know, a lot of times where the photos come in is, you know, they just have a driver only or whatever, and the, the driver's just, you know, from the fire truck or whoever's just taking pictures or someone from EMS actually says, eh, I may need to take a note of this. Um, and even if they take a note and not pictures, that still helps us with, with, you know, the post crash inspection of it. Um, so, I mean, I, I don't know if that really answers it or not. Well, it sounds like the dialogue that we're having right now is an important step and we can continue this at different levels um, because it does seem like, um, as it has been said several times, collaboration is so key here. So if you are a child passenger safety technician, you will get an, well, everyone on this webinar will get an email. So I think that's it.
And uh, I really appreciate all the speakers. You all were wonderful. I feel like I've learned so much and yet there's so much more to learn and, and investigate. And thank you for all, all you attendees um, on this cold snowy day. Please stay safe and healthy. Um, and we'll hopefully talk to you next month at that webinar. Bye.